Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to help you get the most out of your grappling ability and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back to the BJJ Brick Podcast. This week we have episode 354, special guest Nick Salas. Uh, as we kind of talked a little bit about him last week, he's a uh, up-and-coming brown belt. He is just incredible. He's going to drop some knowledge on us, and we are all going to learn from Nick. Uh, as usual, i got my partners in crime, Byron Jabara, Joe Thomas. How are you guys doing today? Doing fantastic. How are you doing? I am doing great. How's the weather and the COVID situation out there in <laughs> New Orleans, Joe? <laughs> well, I'm I'm south of New Orleans in a little swamp town here, and uh, the weather's great. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, it's <laughs> eight 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 forty in the morning. We're recording this, and I went out skateboarding for about forty minutes before we started. It's a beautiful day. Man, Joe, I need to take that advice from you there, and. Uh, do some skateboarding early in the morning. You can't beat that. And it kind of reminds me of a quote. Uh, some people like my advice so much that they frame it upon the wall instead of using it. Uh, once again, some people like my advice so much that they frame it upon the wall instead of using it. And that's by Gordon R. Hickson. What do you guys think about that quote? I, I, I like it. Uh, you might not know that uh, Gordon R. Hickson is Canadian and in Canada, they actually pronounce that uh, Gordon Dixon for anybody that's. Uh... Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but I do like it. We were talking about how, uh, yeah, sometimes we have great ideas, we hear great ideas, and then we never act on them. Yeah, you know, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about, uh, you know, months ago, uh, one of my training partners got furloughed and. Uh, you know, he's asking for some advice, how to get better. He doesn't train all that much. And, you know, I was like, hey, now that you're furloughed, you're not working. Train as much as you possibly can. And, uh, you know, hey, that's a great idea. I'm going to get so much better. But the dude didn't take the advice. He did not train during his free time. And, uh, you know, nothing wrong with that if that's not what you want to do. But, um you know, if somebody like uh, Nick Salas, um, you know, let's take uh, take somebody like Nick there. If Nick gives me advice, I would be a fool not to take it. Uh, you know, Nick walks the walk. Nick is just an incredible jujitsu person. So, you know, if he tells me something and, and I keep my ears open and listen to it, it's probably, well, it's going to be beneficial to me to take that advice. And if I don't take that advice, Nick's going to look at me like, you know, Hey, this guy is not serious about what he does. He doesn't care. And, uh, you know, why put that quote up on my wall with a frame, uh, where it's not doing me any good. It may look good, you know, decorating my wall, but it's not doing me any good. Take that advice from experts like Nick or Byron and, uh, you know, get better. Yeah. So I just think it boils down to so many times we know what we should be doing in order to reach our goals and we just don't do those things. And, uh, it's just, you know, you've, you've got to make the steps small enough to where you can accomplish them and, and tackle them one at a time and, 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 and get to where you want to be on your goal. That, uh, I guess with that, I'll bridge myself over to the off the mat lesson <laughs> before we uh, get into our interview. Uh, I don't know why, but I started uh, looking into just different bridges of the world. And so it's a suspension bridge. Byron. Yes. Byron. Hey, real quick. Sorry for interrupting you. Did you check the bridges of Madison County? No. I, okay. <laughs> check it out, Byron. Good flick. That's a, okay. Well, thank you, Gary. You're always uh, okay. recommending great movies, I guess. <laughs> Movie or show? Uh, movie, Byron. Okay. Actually, I've never watched it. It was supposed to be a joke, but I guess since you've never even heard of the movie, <laughs> it's not even a it's, joke. Uh, it didn't work. So uh, uh, let's uh, let's just skip that part. Okay. Yeah. Let's uh, let's get back. Let's to cross that Byron's. stream. Let, let let's get back to the bridges, Byron. You got me in suspense. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. So <laughs> we'll start with that, Joe. So there's uh, a suspension bridge. If you think of like the Golden Gate Bridge, it's got. Uh, it's basically being held up by cables, 
And and so the longest uh, suspension bridge in the world is in uh, Kobe, Japan, and it's 1,991 meters. And I did the math on Google, and that's about a mile and a quarter for a suspension bridge. That's the longest that, one in the world? Yeah. Is that the length of the bridge or the length of the span that's being suspended? That's right, Joe. Uh, didn't do that type of detail. To- <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm just curious. Uh, Come on, Bob. I, I would imagine that's the span. I don't. That's a good question. But I it, believe it, some it, suspension bridges have multiple spans. There we the go. Pieces. There we go. So the the idea of putting multiple pillars in there to that's probably the length of the span. Then, so the longest bridge in the world is uh, 164,000 meters, and I'll translate that, and that's in uh, China. But that translates to 102 miles. So you're looking at a mile and a quarter versus 102 miles. And the difference is, is that there's support every uh, now and then, or you know, to, to help uh, bridge the, the span, I guess. <laughs> I don't know, bridge the gap in between. And that, and that that's a high high speed rail in China. It, and I was thinking about that, like that's crazy difference in, in the in the way these two bridges are made. And one you could. That it is done. The, maybe the water's too deep, or you know, some reason or other, you can't uh, you know reach that deep, or I don't know what other. Maybe the, the ground isn't strong enough to support uh, the weight of a bridge in those spots. And and one maybe it's a more shallow body of water, and you could you could you know build support where you need to. And with jujitsu, uh, I've been doing more uh, studying of technique, you know, during this the the COVID nineteen thing, and so. I, I, I'll watch techniques and stuff, and and the ones that relate to my game, like anything. Uh, I was, I was uh, looking at some uh, um, leg attacks, you know, and and some some foot locks and heel hooks and that sort of thing. And a lot of them start, start from butterfly guard. I'm like, this is great. I love playing butterfly guard. This is this is a natural fit for me. But if they would have all started from a position that I am not familiar with. That would be me trying to, uh, you know, make my suspension quite a bit further, and maybe even make it to where I need to first learn that the system of, uh, you know, whatever. I'll just go worm guard because I don't play worm guard. Um, just be, just, and I don't have anything against worm guard. I, I just don't play that because I play the same game gi and no gi basically, and because I don't get to. Um, I just want to work on something for a, a month or a week or whatever <clears throat> and not have to stop at working on that on days I show up without the gi. So that just hasn't been part of my game. I, I recognize it as a, as a valid, important part of jiu-jitsu. <laughs> I get tied up and swept with all the time. Anyway, but if I were to try to learn a particular sweep from Burn Guard, that would be me trying to uh, hold that suspension bridge up probably too far. I need to learn the basics of that position first and then – uh, and then I can learn particular sweeps and, and the and the nuances of of that uh, position. Really, with anything with jujitsu, if if you're finding out that your your half guard sweep isn't working, is it not working because they're passing your half guard almost immediately? Well, maybe you have some problems with even maintaining a half guard. Versus if it's not working because um, you you have to re- resort to something else or you get confused, whatever. Like if you're trying to learn something new. Does it fit into your pre-existing game? If it does, you're trying to build a shorter bridge and not have to deal with the long span. Does that make sense? Yeah, I like that. I feel um, like I feel like all of my ultimate lessons end with me saying, "Does that make sense?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I think kind of what you're getting at is the further the reach, uh, the the more support uh, you might have to put into place to get there. Um, so it makes sense to me. Yeah. Well, that's good. Good show. At least, at least one of you guys it made sense for. No, Byron, I was just waiting the whole time for uh, somehow the fire trucks to get pushed into the suspension bridge. Like, do fire trucks go over the suspension bridge better than support bridges or whatever other type of bridges are? I Yeah. I uh, I will say this as a personal note on this uh, the bridge story. I've crossed the Golden Gate Bridge three times. Sweet. Two of them on accident. <laughs> we were we were approaching the, the bridge, and uh, we we're going to pull off on the last thing to go look at it, you know, on the last exit to, for the outlook, and miss that. So once you're on, you've kind of committed. <laughs> 
And so we, we get to the side, we look at it. And then the next morning we were going to go, uh, do a run across it. We, we actually did run across the back and forth on the bridge, but we were same thing. We were approaching, okay, where did I pull off? Where did I pull off? And then, Oh, you know, I'm on the bridge now. And then we crossed it and we started to run from the other side. So crossed it three times, twice on accident. How far, how, how long is the Golden Gate Bridge? I don't, Not in meters, but I miles. Could, I could, yeah, I could Google that real quick, Gary, but it was a, yeah. it was a reasonable run. It wasn't insane. I don't know if it was a 5K run back and forth or you know, yeah. a few miles. I've, I've got a good bridge run for you. The uh, Pontchartrain Bridge here in Louisiana, it's just yeah. a few miles away. Yeah, it's the longest bridge, continuous bridge over water. And it's 23.8 miles, so... Uh, 9,500 concrete pilings. So that's a lot of support to put in place to get from one to the other. Wow. I think Byron could run that easily. Well, it's not even a marathon, so he's done yeah. that before. You're in good shape, Byron. I, I've driven yeah. across that bridge, but uh, haven't I, ran I, it. Byron, you've been everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not joking on this one. That's pretty impressive. I, I know. it went to China to do the research on the first bridge you talked <laughs> that about. That didn't happen. <laughs> the Golden Gate, and I just Googled, the Golden Gate Bridge is, is 1.7 miles across. So Man, you can do it in uh, under four miles. I don't think uh, I could run it. I bet you would finish the task, though, Kerry. Well, if I uh, took your advice and listened to it instead of framing it, I'd probably, uh, you know, you're a better runner than me. You know... Speaking of that, it is pretty cool. You you really are a better runner than me. It's great that you're finally better than me at something, Byron. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I get, you got to hold on. To, I got to hold on to one category. <laughs> but anyway, guys, let's roll our interview with Nick Salas. We all know our jujitsu works in the street. But have you ever asked yourself if your jiu-jitsu would work in the jungle? Well, now I bet you can't get that thought out of your head. And there's only one way to find out. Introducing Gary and Joe's Interactive Tiger Grappling Zoo. Here you'll find out if your mataleon can stand up to a real lion. Or if your leg lock game is good enough to catch a tiger by a toehold. Gary and Joe's Grappling Zoo now features a brand new belt system. Well, it's pretty much the same belt system. But for stripes, we use tiger stripes. For a limited time, get your Joe and Gary riding on a tiger tattoo for half price. Or just get the Gary tattoo for free. So come on down to Gary and Joe's interactive Tiger Grappling Zoo. Located between Gary's home in Kansas and Joe's home in Texas. That's right, for you geography aces, Oklahoma. Gary and Joe are not responsible for bumps, bruises, scratches, major injuries, including broken bones and bites from both animal or Joe. The complete breakdown of your entire jiu-jitsu system. Regrets about your Gary tattoo. Dojo storms are not recommended and have been the result of the death of the entire storm team. We'll see all you cool cats and kittens in the jungle. Hold up on buying those tickets, you cool cats and kittens. Gary and Joe's Zoo isn't sponsoring the BJJ Brick podcast. In fact, it's not even real if you can believe that. The BJJ Break Podcast is sponsored by the listeners just like you through our Patreon account. Check it out in the show notes, my friends. Thank you for your support. All right, my friends, I'm happy to bring Nick Salas to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Uh, Nick, we just spoke last week with uh, Daniel and uh, your roommates with him. Uh, welcome to the yep. show. I'm excited to get both of you guys on here back to back. Oh man, thank you. It's a it's a it's a true honor to be on here, and I'm excited to talk about jujitsu and what me and Danny been up to, and uh, kind of like my take and philosophy on training and whatnot. So no, thank you so much for having me on here. Awesome. Can you just uh, give me a little bit of a personal history about your jujitsu and and where you are today? Oh man, yeah. Uh, so. Me and jiu-jitsu go like way back. I mean, martial arts has been a part of my life 
uh, for basically as long as I can remember because uh, I started Taekwondo when I was four years old. Uh, that's a pretty young age. That's like an age where you're just starting to learn how to talk and walk and, and move around. And you really don't know who you are at that point. So I was basically on the mats at age four. And through age four and nine, I would say, I was focused on Taekwondo. And from there, I would do karate. Uh, my dad put me in a bunch of different programs, ranging from like Muay Thai, wrestling. And I would say I first was exposed to jujitsu around age 12. Um, and it wasn't through like conventional means. It was because of the academy I was training karate at actually offered uh, a grappling portion to the karate. So it was basically like a kid's MMA before MMA was actually popular, you know. I'm 24 years old now, so uh, you can do the math. That's pretty long ago. You know, MMA wasn't really too mainstream at the time. And I was just really captivated with the grappling aspect of things. Like I was always proficient with the striking, but something about grappling just came natural to me. I remember being in class and we would spar with the grappling allowed. And I would just feel gravitated towards like taking people down and controlling them uh, once we were on the ground and progressing the mount and then uh, using strikes from there. So it didn't take much for my dad to be like, you know what, I think this is something we should focus on. And from there, uh, he brought me over to, at the time, it was a school um, in Red Bank. It's not there anymore. Red Bank, New Jersey, uh, taught by David Lentz, uh, black belt under the Machado brothers. And, you know, I really got my start there. Um, I was about like 13, 14 at the time. And then from there, man, it just like kind of took off. I was pretty active through high school. Uh, I would compete basically like every weekend until really like the decision to apply to colleges came around. And that's... <laughs> That's really when I started to, to, uh, to focus on other things. I went to college, of course. I took like three years off jiu-jitsu. And uh, yeah, man, then I started get, getting back into jiu-jitsu uh, my last couple of years of college. And, you know, made my round my way around to Marcelo's. We can talk more about that, of course. And just basically, you know, graduating college and making the most important decision I've ever had to make in my life, which was, should I get a regular job or should I just pursue my passion? And honestly, I owe that one to like my lab director at the time who was uh, overlooking my, uh, what do you call it? Like, uh, uh, I was basically just shadowing a lab director for a fertility clinic and I was just kind of getting my hours, uh, which was a requirement to graduate. And my lab director asked me, he's like, uh, do you love the sciences? I was like, yeah, the sciences are all right, you know, like. You know, I could see this being like a like a full full time job for me, a career. And he was like, "All right, but can you do it for the rest of your life?" And I was like, "I'm not sure." And he was, you know, he was quite aware like how uh, involved in jujitsu I was. So he asked me, "How about jujitsu? Is that something you could do for the rest of your life?" And I was like, "One hundred percent." And my lab director told me with certainty, like, if you know that's what you want to do, then. For me, it's a no-brainer and basically told me I should pursue jiu-jitsu and it was something that I was kind of wrestling with in my mind and that was kind of like the the straw that broke the camel's back for me. Like from that day on, I just decided to pursue jiu-jitsu full-time. Uh, I kind of like pushed off the science career and, you know, and I guess two years after that or no, not a year and a half after that, I'm, I'm where I am today uh, training with Danny during the quarantine, you know, basically every day. So that's kind of like my background on uh, jiu-jitsu and how I got started and where I am today. It, so uh, competition-wise, how has that been for you? Uh, competition? So I would say during high school, I was super active, probably the most active I've ever been in my whole life. Uh, you know, like I said, my father would bring me to tournaments every weekend. One weekend, it would be Naga. The next weekend, it would be Grappler's Quest. He was always pushing for me to do the adults division, the absolute adults division. And mind you, this is before flow grappling. So uh, it wasn't anything special at the time, I guess you could say. And, um, you know, I went on to win Nogi Worlds as a juvenile uh, blue belt when I was 16 years old. And the year after that was SAT. So like I said, you know, my interest in jiu-jitsu started to fade because I was thinking more about going to college. And really, like, the competitive aspect didn't pick up until a year and a half ago when I decided to pursue jiu-jitsu full-time. And that's when I really went, like, full force uh, with Danny. You know, Danny's another person that was a huge influence in my life, like, pushing me to compete a lot. 
And I would say between when I was in high school and now that I'm able to kind of compete whenever I want uh, has been the parts of my life where I focus on competition the most. But, you know, I love competition. Competition is uh, a super important part of like jujitsu progression for me. And, uh, you know, it's something that I couldn't see myself not doing, you know. So, but I'm still far from where I want to be, you know, like the real goal is to get that black belt and to compete at the highest level being the world championships. And hopefully I can win that. Wow. So th- that's a, that's awesome goal. What what are the steps to that, that you see? Like what, what are some of the, uh, the key things you have to do to make that happen? For the world championships, right? Yeah. At a black belt uh, level. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Yeah, that's 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 the one that's the one question that keeps me up at night every day, you know, like what do I because every second from now until then counts, right? So, sure. And there's no one that could really teach you how to be a world champion because everyone has done it so differently. And so it's kind of hard to just model yourself after one person because of course there's elements of each person's journey that make sense to you, right? Like Marcelo is you know prioritizes character and he, he trains hard um and then you get guys like Hafa Mendez who were super into strength and conditioning and who studied a lot of jiu-jitsu and so like all these guys have so many different elements to their journey to being world champions that it's hard to like model yourself after one person so what I'm starting to find out is really that my journey is going to ultimately come down to myself and what I feel like is necessary to make that goal uh, a reality. So every day I kind of try to do the best I can to, uh, get it a, an inch closer to that ultimate goal of being a world champion. So I push my, myself every day, you know, I'm um, I'm studying every day. I'm making every day count. Uh, me and Danny are, you know, constantly critiquing each other and giving each other feedback, making the most of this time. Uh, and you know, especially now with the quarantine going on, it's super important that the moment I wake up, every second that comes after that is dedicated to jujitsu. And I, I truly believe this because once this is all over, we're never going to be in a situation like this where all we need to think about is jujitsu. And the only time we have to to ourselves is to think about jujitsu because when life goes back to normal, you know, we're going to go back to our normal training routine, you know, responsibilities and bills start catching up again. Uh, making those four hour train rides back and forth to Marcelo's, you know, so life gets uh, a little bit more chaotic. So right now, just doing the best I can to, uh, uh, ensure that I'm taking the right steps towards that goal. Some, for some people, they get, I don't know, injured or they, they go away for a little while for family situations or whatever it happens. And sometimes when they come back, they're actually better. <laughs> I feel yeah. like being locked in, in a, you know, sharing a, uh, being roommates with, with Danny. It's like, that could easily happen to you guys. You guys are likely to come yeah. back more technical, more, uh, diverse in your games and, and a deeper, uh, pool of knowledge. So the funny thing with me and Danny is that, uh, while this was all going down, we were actually in Sweden with John Thomas, you know? Yeah. And that's when the first case really like hit America is while we were over there. So honestly, since the inception of the pandemic, I've been with Danny. So the natural progression was to be quarantined with each other. So we kind of knew ahead of time what, you know, worst case scenario, uh, what we were going to do. And we knew that we were going to dedicate all this time to jujitsu. But you're completely right. You know, a lot of people are, are trying to recover from injuries. And this is the perfect opportune moment to recover and they're going to come back better from that. But like you said, you know, me and Danny, we're not injured at the moment. So we have to make every minute count right now. Yeah. It, and, and so much of the top level grappling game is, it sounds like I'm not there, so I don't would know, but it sounds like a lot of it is <laughs> figuring out the game and learning. And, and it's yeah. like, you guys are all in great shape. You're all fast. You're all strong. All that stuff is, yeah. is that's everybody. But so much of it is, is figuring out the pieces to the puzzle where like so much of my game, I'm a casual grappler. Uh, I go learn from my coach. I go learn from my teammates and, and I go and have a good time. I'm not trying to 
invent solutions to problems. But it, it appears yeah. that, that you guys are doing that and and trying to develop new parts of this game. Yeah, I mean, because while we are trying to be competitors, we're we're also learning for the sake of becoming teachers in the future. And I I I try to do both when I'm learning, right? Uh, because if I only think about myself as a competitor, I'm going to really tunnel vision myself towards tools that only benefit me. So, you know, like I said, at the moment, um, I'm really pushing like the online training. And so when I get these opportunities to teach people overseas, not every time are they going to have a question that's, you know, pertaining to my game that I play in competition, right? Uh, sometimes they're going to ask me about a technique that, you know, I don't personally use. So I think it's important that in this uh, in this exploration of knowledge, you know, that me and Danny are doing to become world champions, that we also make time to learn aspects of jujitsu that we don't personally apply. Um, and for, and I think that's important for the future when we decide to become teachers, that so that we can pass on that knowledge to people who you know would benefit from that uh, from that uh, information. So, like you said, you know, you rely on your coach to give you that information, right? And I think that's super important because a coach is someone who should have experienced all all these things for you, right? Like someone who uh, wants the title of coach, someone who wants to make money off jujitsu. I truly believe that person has had to been there, uh, you know, have have had to competed and and put themselves through all these situations that me and Danny are going through, so that they can provide their students with. Uh, the best information they can. So, you know, right now as a competitor, sure, you know, I'm, I have to figure out things on my own. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily have someone telling me what to do, but I, I'm also doing this so that in the future I can, you know, if you were my student, I can shorten your, uh, your journey, you know, in half. So I can just provide you with all the answers without you having to do that yourself, if that makes sense. Yeah. Do you think that becoming a world champion makes you a better coach or is that is that a big element to the to the coaching pie no you know honestly and that's that's actually a really good question because from my personal experience the best coaches i've had weren't necessarily world champions or or i should say the people who have had the most influence on my jiu-jitsu aren't necessarily world champions like danny danny's not a world champion and he's probably the most influential person in my jiu-jitsu Um, I think when it comes to coaching people who want to be world champions, I think that, that, that certain accolade does kind of strengthen that relationship because that person is trying to accomplish what you have done. But I don't think as a coach, uh, like a, uh, like a standard coach that just trying to teach students who just love jujitsu and who who are just trying to get into the sport. I don't think it's necessary because, uh, the kind of sacrifices required to become a world champion aren't sacrifices that are exclusive to jiu-jitsu, you know? Like, I think uh, becoming a world champion in jiu-jitsu is just like any other sport. Uh, and I think those sacrifices only make sense to other people who are trying to pursue the same goal. So, you know, I don't think it's super necessary. But I do think that uh, being a world champion is a good – uh, marker for someone who who works hard. So if you're looking for a coach who, you know, without a doubt, you can believe that they've worked hard for everything they've they've accomplished, then you know you know you're getting that if they're a world champion, right? But that's not to say that you know your local black belt doesn't know how to work hard just because they're not a world champion. Yeah. Sometimes I think that the 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 people that learn jujitsu pretty easy don't understand how hard it is for people like me to learn this. Oh, <laughs> like okay. jujitsu is really yeah. hard and like uh, somebody will show me a technique and i'll try it and i'll mess it up yeah. and then i'll they'll have to go show me again and some people uh i don't maybe you're this way can see a technique and then they can do that technique mm-hmm. i have to like mess it up yeah. a few times before i even try like before it's even possible oh, for me to pull off sometimes <laughs> So, so like I said, I've been doing jujitsu or I've been doing martial arts rather, right? Like on the mat my yeah. whole life and I still can't just see a technique and do it. So I'm always puzzled and like super impressed whenever I see like these super athletes just kind of like see the move once and they're able to replicate it to a T, right? Like I think that's insane. Uh, but I, no, I've never been that way to be honest. Um, I've actually like everything I do has been at some point 
a move I've had to break down into several components and just something I had to like progressively drill into my game, you know, starting with static drilling, progressing into resistance drilling, progressing into sparring. Nothing that I do has ever been something I've just picked up by by uh, a visual cue or some video or something like that or just watching my professor do a move. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, a lot of world caliber athletes are like that, right? Um, you know, this is a crazy sport where, you know, a big part of it is mental. There's the, the chess aspect of everything, but it's also a super physical sport. So it allows for those super athletes to kind of uh, – uh, to succeed. You know, there's so many ways you can express jujitsu. I don't necessarily think a specific way is better than the other, but for me personally, the way that makes the most sense is for me to break these techniques down, understand why they work, right? Like for example, if you ask me, Hey Nick, can you, uh, can you tell me why this move works? Uh, I don't want to have to say, yeah, uh, come over here. Let me feel it real quick. You know what I mean? I want to be able to tell you just by uh, understanding the mechanics of the move just because, you know, I've broken everything down already. You know, I want to be able to, to, to explain a move to you without having to feel something um, because, you know, at the end of the day, there are a lot of people in this game that have, uh, have succeeded jujitsu just through feel, you know, and that's kind of like what you're saying. Like these people that just see a move and they, and they can feel it. When they roll, it just comes naturally. And it's very hard for people who don't learn that way to to kind of uh, be in the middle of that because it can kind of make you self doubt yourself. It can make you feel like, wow, like can I be successful in this sport if I if it doesn't just feel natural to me if I just don't pick something up visually? So you know, part of me and Dan's uh, Danny's goals is to uh, kind of like communicate this to people that that's not true. That a, a lot of high level competitors actually have to go the extra mile to break everything down and to reverse engineer everything and to learn everything in these baby steps because it's not easy for a lot of us, you know? So, uh, and, it, and it's, 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 it's interesting because if you're in, a, in an academy where the instructor is one of those athletes that just kind of learn by feeling things, then you could feel like that's the norm, right? So that's like your perspective on things. But in, on the other hand, if you're part of an academy where the instructor is – like nerds out on jujitsu and is super scientific about everything, then that's your perspective on jujitsu. You feel like that's what you have to do to succeed. So yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, jujitsu is a super amateur sport and uh, kind of like what is right or wrong is up in the air, right? And, and how we should learn jujitsu is kind of up in the air at the moment. But no, that's a super interesting question. But for me personally, I feel like I've always had to break things down. And uh, and it took me a while to learn everything I do. You say uh, jujitsu is an amateur sport. Are you referring to the the training methods, uh, the the mm. the scene as professionalism? Are you like what are you referring to that? Yeah, so it's definitely an amateur sport in a financial way. Yeah, but that's not when when I mention it being an amateur sport. That's I'm not even considering that. Okay, uh, I'm I'm considering how people. Uh, treat themselves as athletes. Um, and it's because, you know, uh, before becoming a full-time jiu-jitsu competitor, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time around wrestlers, like, uh, you know, collegiate wrestlers and MMA fighters, and even athletes that are part of other sports, and just seeing how they, at their level, take things seriously compared to, like, a lot of elite athletes in the jiu-jitsu scene, uh, you would be completely perplexed, Right. I know a lot of guys in jiu-jitsu that simply just show up to training at, you know, let's say 10 a.m. They get their 20 hard rounds in and, you know, they go home and they don't think about jiu-jitsu for the rest of the day. And, you know, if they want to do something extra, it's going to be a strength conditioning session later on, you know. So, of course, jiu-jitsu is super physical. And, you know, I'm not expecting that everyone is physically training all day every day. I think that's unrealistic, but you'd be surpri surprised by how many people in the sport don't study jujitsu, right? They don't study techniques. They don't brainstorm on how to make their techniques more efficient. They don't uh, study, uh, you know, body mechanics, how to, how to, how to become more mobile, how to become more flexible, 
They don't study how to learn better, you know. Um, and of course, if this was a more professional sport, you'd have a staff, you'd have people kind of doing this and delegating this for you. But, you know, at least at this day and age, we should be taking these responsibilities and doing everything we can to succeed and make this sport a professional sport. So in the meantime, we kind of have to take on these different roles for ourselves. But, you know, the fact of the matter is there's not a lot of people doing that. And it's and it's surprising really to me because, uh, you know, I feel like this is my passion and I couldn't imagine myself at this point doing anything else, especially everything I've been through with almost choosing a career in science and deciding to do jujitsu like very last second. I couldn't picture myself now doing anything else any other way than how I'm doing it. And that's basically like being stuck in a room with Danny, uh, studying jujitsu all day, every day and uh, and ensuring that i'm i'm being the best jujitsu athlete i can possibly be yeah it's it's really kind of an advantage that people are not taking it real serious and, I, and you I are i mean so. yeah. <laughs> i mean even just no, i don't I, know if it was 10 years ago people didn't they were like i do jitsu i don't lift weights i don't need to do strength and conditioning <laughs> it's like i have jujitsu ju- it's like really like it's not a disadvantage yeah. to go do extra stuff and and to get in really good shape before you do this <laughs> It, uh, people are yeah, saying like, they don't study. <laughs> like, yeah, they don't study. And and if you went into like any other field and 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 the top guys, you know, came out and, and kind of like wore it as a badge of honor and said, we don't study this. You know, imagine if like Neil deGrasse Tyson said, I don't study astrophysics. Like it, it just doesn't make sense. Um, and, you know, seeing other people in other sports, like taking their sport more seriously and, and doing their best to improve and Areas that don't even have to be jujitsu uh, specific. It could just be like, you know, improving hip mobility, you know, and, and, and doing a hip mobility session like once every three days and, and, and things like that. But if you don't go, you know, this information is not going to come to you, right? Like no one's going to like knock on your door and tell you, look, you, you should do hip mobility to improve your guard in jujitsu. Like it, it should be your responsibility as an athlete if you want this to be a professional sport to take on that responsibility and, and search this knowledge for yourself, you know, because no one did it for me and Danny. No one did it for me. So and at the end of the day, it's because the sport is very amateur and there is no pressure. Like you said, it's an, it's almost like an advantage that no one's doing this because that's the that's the norm. That's the standard. The standard is just to show up to class, train hard. I mean, I think now we're seeing that people are starting to study more. I think now people are starting to take strength and conditioning more serious, but I still think it's far from where it should be. Yeah. I think, I mean, the, I I think some people are in a room with a lot of really talented grapplers and they're able to, that's what you're saying, like get there at 10 in the morning, do 20 good rolls and then be done. Like there's so much grappling ability in that room in order for that to work Mm -hmm. but a lot of times yeah you know we're not in those rooms and we need to go online and watch footage or we need to go watch this instructional or you know watch this instagram video that you guys are making (laughs) like there's a lot of (laughs) other ways to learn jujitsu and you're still learning it you don't have to learn it like on the mat with that one person so it's Mm -hmm. there's definitely a like an explosion in uh learning abilities and techniques and people out there helping share their knowledge that they, that they have developed. Yeah. I think that's the goal. I I, I truly believe that's the goal and it's to make learning cool. You know, I think there's like in other, like, you know, we think back to high school, you know, being a nerd, there's like a stigma attached to that. And I think that exists even in jujitsu, right? Like, so I think the ultimate goal is to make learning cool because like you said, you know, you may or may not have access to a gym full of monsters, but if those guys aren't studying and they're still, you know, murdering you on the mat, like what's the incentive to study, right? So I guess the idea is like I want to make learning cool and I want to show that maybe you, you, you don't have to be a natural athlete, you know, but there is a way to close that gap and that gap is through studying. Yeah. So, it, it, I, and I truly believe that. It feels super cool when you, you you find a technique or a position that you can get to and you study that. And like like I'm not picturing mm-hmm. like okay I'm gonna study this mount thing and then you and I roll and I never get mounted and I can't even like but if I could like, yeah. butterfly guard boom I can get to that most times when I roll people uh, for a little bit anyway mm-hmm. like so I find a thing maybe I'm gonna do a sweep or a guillotine whatever and I really work on that mm-hmm. and I study it and I do it like and then it works 
that's cool. <laughs> Studying mm-hmm. became cool as yeah. soon as I, as so I got the tap. I, I, I'm curious. Yeah, so I'm curious. Like, and, and this is just a question, and you, you can answer it quickly. So, what is the general structure of your class, your jujitsu class that you go to? Yeah, so I'm a, a student, uh, 19 times out of mm-hmm. 20. Um, we we come in. Okay. We it's. I, I go to a lot of afternoon classes, which are different than the evening classes. It's more people who are mm-hmm. um, on lunch break, and uh, you know what? We 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 joke around before we class even starts. We have a good time. Everybody's really friendly. Uh, we we do a bit of a warm up. Um, we do some technique. We'll do a little bit of positional sparring, and then we roll. and the And the class is uh, fairly quick as far as an hour 15 or so and people got to get going. Yeah. Um, but yeah. That's- so yeah. So it's super interesting because that, and that's like the, it's pretty typical. I guess you could say the generic formula. Yeah. yeah it's pretty typical, right? You have your warm up, you have your move or, or sequence, whatever it may be, situational sparring and rolling. Right. So I guess for me, it, it's, it's more about like, how can we implement a structure that maximizes learning? And like you said, you, you, if you're trying to learn a mount escape, how do you uh, how do you implement that if you're never given that opportunity during sparring, right? And, yeah. And maybe you're focusing on collar sleeve, but the the theme of the month is X guard, and the situation sparring is built around that, you know. So how do you feel about like uh, like in class, you're given uh, you're allocated a certain amount of time to just kind of work in situational spar, the position of your interest, right? And the coach or the instructor can just guide you through that. And if you need help, they're you know, a hand raise away from coming over and giving you whatever tips you need to modify uh, whatever problem you have, and then you you troubleshoot that. And that's, then that's, once that session's over, that how do you feel about that? Yeah, that, that really demands the culture uh, of the gym to mm-hmm. be uh, purposeful. You, yeah. need, you need to have – people pair off and I don't know how many times I, I start a roll with somebody. I grab a blue belt and I see anything you're working on. And I'm literally, I might as well say, do you want to start in Mount or on my back? Like, what do you want to work on? And they'll say, Oh, nothing, yeah. nothing. I'm like, okay, we're just <laughs> going to roll then. Like you got nothing you're working yeah, on. Yeah. <laughs> like have something you're working on or just tell me something and we'll work in that position like from the role. But, uh, so it just takes that culture of, you guys are all students of this, and and I and as an instructor, I could help guide and teach you. But you got to go out there and, and study as well. And and I think that if if that's the culture, if people are going out there with independent interests and 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 coming in with a desire to do something, collar sleeve stuff, you know, like if that's what you're on fire about, and we come in and I show half guard passes the entire time, like it's not gonna not gonna interest you today. So exactly. I, I really like and, that, but you got to have the, the students to back it up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because, look, the whole point of the school is to help you get better. Sure. And I can't tell you enough, before going to Marcelo's, of course, uh, going to just regular classes, I felt like I wasn't progressing. I, I basically felt like I was just going to class for those last 15 minutes of sparring or 30 minutes of sparring to try the moves I've been trying to uh, uh, add into my game. You know, And I feel like that's a total waste of time. Yeah. So you're completely right. So how do we shift the culture in jujitsu to embrace studying? Because I can't tell you enough how many times I'm like talking to someone who practices jujitsu and I'm like, who's your favorite grappler? Who's your favorite jujitsu athlete? And they say, oh, I don't really watch jujitsu, you know? And look, I'm not saying you have to watch jujitsu, but as a school, I feel like as a coach, I can't make you watch jujitsu in your spare time. But I can at least, like you said, create a culture, and I truly believe this is like the instructor's responsibility. I can create a culture in which kind of encourages you to watch jujitsu to at least get better. Because if you're, you know, of course, people go to jujitsu to lose weight and you know for, you know, the social benefits of it. But you know, at the end of the day, we're all trying to get better. Yeah. You know, there's a rank system for a reason to track progress and to give you a goal to strive for. And you know, I. If your goal is to stick to jiu-jitsu, which in- inevitably ends with you getting a black belt, you know, you should have fell in love with learning by then. Yeah. And I truly believe if we do that, then you're not going to have people who quit jiu-jitsu as soon as they get their black belt, right? Why did they quit jiu-jitsu? Because they got their black belt. Because they weren't in love with learning. You know, they don't do jiu-jitsu to learn. They did jiu-jitsu because, you know, it was just, uh, it was, it was just something to do. It's just a hobby. Right. So, 
you know, I if we can change the culture, I think that's and, – and, and the culture being one that embraces learning. I think, one, we can make the sport more professional. Two, people will be encouraged to learn even when they get their black belt and jiu-jitsu will be like this infinite loop of like learning and improvement. And three, I think people are going to actually enjoy training more because it's not going to be about, you know, showing up to class and running in circles for 20 minutes. And, yeah. then, you know, the instructor shows a cool move and you're in awe for like 30 seconds, but then you forget it the next day, you know, it's going to be a more intimate experience. Yeah. So that's kind of like uh, my philosophy. I, I like your, your question. Who's your favorite grappler? And if they don't watch competitive jiu-jitsu, okay. like yeah, I would almost say – Pick one in the room right now. Just pick one of your training partners, and that's your favorite. Like that's someone to model after. And, wow, and I that's think, actually a really good point. Yeah, because I mean, a lot of people just don't care about them. Like they just come to train, and it's it's fun. You know, it's exciting. Like they, I think a lot of people do have to, you have to fall in love with the learning journey because it's so big, and it's so rewarding mm-hmm. to learn something new and then have it work. <laughs> Not somebody who doesn't want it to but, work. One hundred percent, and I think you've you've kind of filled that loophole in my argument just now. Like whenever someone comes with the rebuttal that, you know, they don't like watching jujitsu and they don't watch jujitsu, uh, the point of saying, you know, then who in this room inspires you? That's such a good answer to that statement because there's always someone in the room that's better than you. I'm assuming, right? Because if you're the best guy in the room, you should, we probably shouldn't be there. Or maybe it's um, the guy who's, but, who's 60 years old and, and who's just, who comes in and just, yeah. just leaves it on the mat every time. I don't know. Yeah, no, 100%. There's different types of inspiration, right? There's inspiration technically, there's inspiration physically, there's inspiration intellectually. So I think that's a great response to that answer because so the, there's always something you can look to in, I the, think, in the very happy train app. Yeah, I, I'm really interested in, in how classes are ran and how coaching and, and, and instructing, which are two different skills, are are done mm-hmm. well. But uh, I think in order for the idea that students come in and they work on something – I, I do think you probably need to, and I'd like to hear your opinion on this, you have some sort of a uh, a beginner structure for the beginners to come in and learn. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't know how much, yeah. you know, like, I don't know if it's blue belt or six months on the mat or, um, you know, a month or 10 classes or whatever, but you need yeah. to have some sort so, of organized thing at the beginning. Yes, and, and that's why, like, starting at white belt, there's definitely a fundamentals program, and that's a fundamentals program that, is open to anyone, right? You could be a black belt and take a fundamentals class, right? And the fundamentals class should be so rich and in depth that you feel like you could take a fundamental class every day and still learn something. And you could take that same class for 10 years and still learn something. But then once you get your blue belt, and remember, the option to take the fundamental classes are still there. You should start exploring things on your own. You should start figuring out your own game. You should start uh, taking more control of what you want to do. But of course, you know, the coach is there to guide you and the coach is there to steer you in a direction if, if, if needed, right? Because a lot of people don't know what games to play, you know, what, what style fits their body type. And that's something a coach should have enough experience to say, Hey, Jimmy, you know, you're super long, you know, you're super dexterous. I think spider guard will go good with your body type. And, you know, and the guy or girl can, you know, take that advice or not and, you know, see if they like playing spider guard. And if not, they can try something else. Yeah. But I think the fundamental program should be so rich that it's an option to take even when you're a black belt. And and that's what I'm saying by uh, when, when we say jujitsu is an amateur sport, it's because we think that the fundamentals of jujitsu are more broad than they actually are. Right. So like today, me and Danny were training right before this podcast and we were talking about guard retention versus pass prevention right okay and then guard prevention when you're on top all right and let's just stick to the to the other uh two that i mentioned so what do you think is the difference between guard retention and pass prevention guard retention would be something like Mm -hmm. i need i need to be fully aware of of how you're doing as far as uh, how your pass is coming along versus my techniques. And I need to like, here's, here's the deal on me. Uh, a lot of my teammates and, and I figured this out and I've been able to deal with it. They they force me to half guard and my half guard isn't very good, <laughs> but I don't uh, like before, uh, like I would just play half guard. I'm happy. Like, Oh, whatever. It's, it's good. I got my underhook. And then they pass my half guard. It's like, yeah. okay, my, my half guard 
is literally halfway to them passing my guard. Like I, yeah, I am not 100%. doing. I got a big problem there, and so I could, yeah. I could, I could try to stop that. Which that's been a better answer for me because half guard, you got to be tough, man. Half guard's brutal on the bottom. Yeah. I'm not that tough of a guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, like I'd rather just not, not play that game at all. So when they start to force the half guard, I used to say, okay, half guard time. Now I say, no, no way. Like I'm not going to play mm-hmm. that game unless unless no absolute last yeah. ditch. Yeah. So uh, just avoiding that part of my game uh, helps me uh, keep my guard and where I can work with the offense. I don't know. What was the? I don't even remember guard retention versus guard. Yeah. Um, what were you yeah, saying? So that would be. Def- yeah. So that would definitely definitely be uh, guard retention, right? To 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 get forced into half guard and to go back to maybe let's say an open guard where the person is now in between your legs again yeah you're you're retaining your guard all right and we can dive deeper into the definition of a guard but i think everyone would agree that the most fundamental and strongest guard based on just leverage and control is the closed guard right yeah i mean you have to pass two guards if you're going to pass the closed guard a lot of times exactly exactly so you know so the furthest away you are from the closed guard, the less of a guard you have, let's say. So, and then you could define uh, pass prevention as any time they're past uh, any sort of guard. So even if the leg is past the half guard, now we're in guard prevention mode, let's say. I mean, pass prevention mode, right? So, and this is just an example. So a fundamentals program should dive deep into these concepts and equip the students with tools to do both and be able to differentiate between the two before they even learn a guard. You see what I'm saying? Uh, I feel like the guard is something that could be more developed, la- developed later on, right? Like if you want to specialize in close guard, by all means, do that once you're in the next phase, right? You don't have to learn like 100 moves from close guard per se when you're a white belt. I think what's more important is learning – uh, you know, the fundamentals, what we define as the fundamentals. And, and an example of that is just like what I said, you know, uh, pass prevention, guard retention is huge. Learning those tools, because those are tools that I see a lot of black belts, they don't have mastered yet, you know? And that's what I mean by like, you can still, you should still be able to take the fundamentals classes no matter what rank you are. And then only when you've mastered, or I should say, are comfortable with all those concepts and all those movements then you're free to move into the next phase, which is developing your game. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then that part of the process of learning jujitsu is so much easier now because by then you already basically understand the, the, the concepts, you understand leverage, you understand frames, you understand angles, you understand how to frame your hips so they can't pin your far hip to the ground, uh, which results in a pass. And, you know, you know, you can't let your foot cross the center line. Otherwise, you get passed. Things like that before you even learn guard because then when you plug in the guard that you choose to focus on for however long, everything makes sense, right? You, there's, a rule, there's a list of rules that you need to abide by in order for your guard to work. And then from there, you can learn more technique. Uh, you could have more technique-oriented lessons like, all right, today we're going to learn a sweep from here, right? Because now you understand the basics of the position. So that's just kind of like my take on yeah. what I feel like uh, a fundamentals program should be. It shouldn't be like, all right, guys, uh, fundamental class number 30. Today we're going to learn how to open a closed guard. Yeah. Right? The hard thing about this, the so. fundamentals class is, is that you have people in there who – I mean it's not like you start a new round the first of the month and everybody's brand mm-hmm. new. Like you even have people who are who are almost done with the fundamentals class you know, or almost have yeah. seen everything. Like it's – Jiu-Jitsu is so hard to get yeah, people to, it's so and it's just about avoiding five. frustrations at the beginning because you're going to suck mm-hmm. at it. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's like you yeah. come in there you think you're going to be great and there's no way you're going to be great when you start like <laughs> but it's just yeah, but see, th- it's just frustrating. Yeah, so for me see, it is frustrating and and that's the problem when people maybe use like self-defense as a hook line to bring people into the school and uh you know only to find out that at the end of the day you know, they're really getting pulled into a sport. You know, I I see that a lot. It's the same thing. So I think when people come in with the expectation and look, I'm not saying that this is the right way to go about it, but if you already sell the idea that jujitsu is a sport and it's a sport of learning, then the student at that point can take 
you know, can, can, uh, see if, if that's something they want to invest their time in or not. You know, I think, yeah, I, I think the, what you're bringing up is super problematic when you're trying to sell it as something maybe fun. Maybe that's your marketing tool. You just do something fun and they're getting frustrated because instead of teaching them a move that they can hit at the end of class when we're sparring to get their endorphins going and the dopamine rush, you know, you're teaching them a, 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 a concept that doesn't make sense at the moment, right? Yeah. So of course you need to find a middle ground. It's I don't think it's black and white. I don't think you can expect people to fall in love with calculus, you know, before they understand basic math or even uh, algebra, for example. But you do need to have uh, aspects of both. You know, I don't believe that it should be super, you know, um, frustrating in the sense that there's no fun involved but i i don't believe in just selling jujitsu as this idea of fun and it's the whole fundamentals program is built around this idea of fun and then finally when they get their blue belts or their purple belts now they're really frustrated because they didn't learn jujitsu if that makes sense yeah yeah it's it's interesting way it's, it's kind of the mix between what's best for the student and what's best for i guess the business of jujitsu and Mm-hmm. Like the, what's best for a student is to learn at the best rate possible, but also yeah. some students will wash out in that versus some. I think it's just like you need to look at the student and give them what you think is best for that person. And it's hard when you have twenty new people versus one new person. You know, like mm-hmm. it's hard to tailor those messages and, and have the the results you want. Um, I, I did want to mention or get to uh, your experience at college. You were studying. You said science. What were you studying? Yeah, so I was a bio major, but my concentration was molecular cell physiology. So uh, basically studying like really small components of cell uh, communication and interactions, uh, you know, protein cascades and things like that. But what I was really trying to get into was uh, embryology and developmental sciences. So uh, I was shadowing at a fertility clinic with the idea of becoming an embryologist. So that was kind of like what I was striving for when I was in college. Wow, that that sounds uh... yeah. It, it, and honestly, <laughs> difficult. Honestly, I'm super. It's still a passion of mine. Like uh, once in a while, I'll throw like a like a, a embryology video on just to stay sharp with like my information because you never know in this day and age. You know, like me and Danny always joke about you know what if after the pandemic there isn't jujitsu. You know, and of course there's gonna be jujitsu, but it's just a you know a funny joke that we kind of uh, uh, throw <laughs> at each other. But, But other things can definitely happen, right? I could definitely be put in a situation where I have to go back and fall on my degree. So I definitely want to be sharp uh, with my knowledge. And and it's just something I'm still passionate about. Maybe not to the point where I'm going to be studying it all day like I am jujitsu, but it's still something that I think about. It's still something like if I'm in a car and not doing anything, instead of listening to a podcast, I'll throw on like a – like a a, a a science video and just kind of like listen along and refresh on my 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 science knowledge did besides it sounds like you had got kind of um guidance from one of your instructors as far as you know following jujitsu versus going to the science career but mm-hmm. do you think you learn something in the sciences that you bring to jujitsu on a consistent basis Oh man, 100%. And that's actually prob- probably the biggest distinguishing uh, uh, like point of my life, right? Like when I was in the sciences, so there's like Jiu-Jitsu Nick before he joined the science program at Monmouth University, and then there's Nick after the science program at Monmouth. And um, before I was like a wrestler, you know, like my grappling style was aggressive. <laughs> I would just try to take the person down and like maul them and hold side control and, and grab an arm bar, maybe take the back, something like that. It was definitely a jujitsu philosophy, philosophy that was more uh, pertaining to control uh, using physicality, right? And then what science taught me was you need to be patient. You know, sometimes like we, we would have projects, for example – where we'd, uh, you know, like have to do a, uh, a DNA genetic tree of our stool samples, right? And this was a project that took like two months, you know, like uh, of me just like reading up on information and reflecting on the information I was, I was getting from this project. And it was a two-month thing. And that's not, that's not something you can do if you're impatient. That's not something you can do if you get frustrated easily. 
So science definitely taught me how to quantify things, how to think about things, how to observe, how to read, uh, you know, not always like, because the thing about science uh, is that you can never go into science with a bias, right? You can never go into an experiment with a, with an answer in mind. You always go into experiment with a hypothesis, but never really knowing what the result is going to be, right? And so in jujitsu, when I study tape and, uh, 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 I'm just trying to improve on my technique. I'm never doing that already knowing what the result is going to be, if that makes sense, right? So I always tell people when you watch tape, when you put on a jiu-jitsu match, don't have in mind what you're looking for. If you watch a tape already telling yourself, I want to learn a De La Hiva sweep, and that sweep doesn't happen in the tape study, you're going to be you know, upset. You're going to be disappointed. You should go into tape study with, the, with an open mind and expect to learn whatever – uh, catches your attention, right? So it could be something cool. It could be a, a, something as simple as a grip exchange, right? And so what science taught me was to like really digest the information that uh, I'm getting from jujitsu and really think about it with that kind of mindset. Uh, and now the Nick, uh, uh, jujitsu Nick after the science program at Mount University is one that kind of like, instead of using physicality, I try to use more of like a, a level head uh, you know, a level-headed approach, uh, a more intelligent approach, a more scientific approach, if you will. So, uh, yeah, there's definitely a huge distinguishing factor between, you know, myself, you know, before and after the science program, for sure. Yeah. And then also with science stuff, it's peer-reviewed. So you take your jiu-jitsu mm-hmm. and you go throw it against mm-hmm. some of your peers. <laughs> so Yeah, exactly. And, and and that's what Danny's for, right? Like, he tells me if, like, a move is bullshit or not, basically. <laughs> so that's the peer review right there. There you go. Um, so how how do you deal with a loss? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, so, of course, there's uh, – it's like grief, right? There's, like, multiple stages of post-loss syndrome, I guess you could say. Okay. Um, <laughs> of course, like, right after you lose, uh, you you just feel like the world has ended, you know, like I think back to like lo- like the losses that stick the most out in my mind are the ones where I felt like I could have done more, but I held back on the trigger, you know, and uh, I-, I never really allowed my jujitsu to express itself. And those are the losses that I always think about. And so after those, I kind of just like really had to self-reflect and-, and ask myself, who am I like as a person? And that sounds kind of like cliche and super like existential, <laughs> but it's true because – you know, we sacrifice so much to be where we are. You know, there's been so many times where I've had to give private lessons for like five weeks straight and all that money, not a dollar left over, all that money went into like buying a plane ticket and, and tournament registration. Cause like I said, this is an amateur sport. Sponsors aren't give, you know, funding these trips and funding these tournaments. So I would literally spend all my money to get to a tournament across the globe only to be disappointed in myself because I didn't do the best of my abilities. I, I didn't lose because because I didn't know how to answer uh, or how to deal with the technique, and I didn't lose because you know the guy was better than me. I lost because I held back, and you know those are the losses where I felt like it took me a day or two. You know, and, and you know different people have different ways of dealing with this. I've heard people say like they bounce back right away. I've had people say they haven't thought about the match in weeks. You know, it takes me like a day to be honest to really like get back on my feet, kind of, uh, kind of talk myself back into uh in normalcy if you will and then immediately after that as soon as that that first phase of like post-loss syndrome uh, goes away i'll just start studying that match right away and figure out what i can do to improve especially the the thing is like when it's a technical thing it's 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 easier to deal with because i can go back to the gym and and kind of iron out those details right away but if it's something more mental, you know it's going to be something that's going to take a little bit longer to deal with. You know, like things like self doubt are always going to be there, but it's not as easy as just saying, "Oh, you know, I'm just just going to change my mentality the next tournament around." You know, it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. So it's, those losses are definitely something. It's like a work in progress. I go back to them in my mind. I try to visualize what I could have done better. Uh, I think that's something I am getting better at. The more I compete, the more comfortable I get competing, the less self-doubt I have. But, you know, it, that's that's a super important thing to do is to always reflect on your losses. And if it's something technical, getting back to the gym, figuring out what you did wrong, uh, making sure that you don't replicate that mistake again 
and whatever success you do have in a competition, you try to replicate. But if it's something mental, you, it's definitely going to be a long-term thing. So try your best to uh, uh, work on that. And of course, people have uh, sports psychologists and and uh, uh, you know things like that. And those those are definitely sources that help tremendously. But unfortunately, I'm not in a situation where I can afford that. So I just try to take it day by day. I try to look up to guys like George St. Pierre, who also suffer from like performance anxiety. You know, George St. Pierre has said that he's he's been in situations where he's lost like multiple nights of sleep leading up to a fight, you know, and listening to guys like that at the highest level uh, and hearing how they handle things and 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 how I can relate to that and apply those things. You know, it's definitely a way. I I I kind of like deal with those losses. Yeah, uh, it, I was I was thinking you mentioned about the uh, the self study stuff and and that's been kind of simmering in my head because I really like that idea of of like I I always if I have something that I'm really passionate about and then never fails to come to class and do something that's like not relative to, related to that at all you know it's like dang it. And then I'll try to pull it off while rolling. If we get a little bit of you know time after class, maybe that's a lot of time people do stuff on their own. But how does that work for kids? Uh, do, do kids just need a more structured class? Yeah. So what what would you define as like a uh, as like a kid? Like what age group is that's that? That's exactly? that's a good question, and I have no idea. <laughs> answer. like uh, I, I yeah. ask I ask a lot of questions about teaching kids because. I don't have that. I would much rather teach a room of uh, adults that are trying to prove me that I'm a bad jujitsu guy. Like, uh, like that's way easier than teaching a group of of seven year olds jujitsu for me. Cause like, I, I don't have those skills. <laughs> like, yeah. it's so a different like, class. Yeah, I feel like I'm in a in a fortunate position because I actually have been in martial arts my whole life. You know, yeah. I was a four year old taekwondo, so I've kind of been able to experience all types of instructors and whatnot. Uh, I asked the question, what age is a kid? Because I could tell you for like maybe at 12 years old, uh, around there, I, I I felt like in my head at least I was an adult. You know, of course, looking back in retrospect, that makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> and there's no way a 12-year-old is an adult. But I felt like then I could at least be treated like an adult and have uh, – and, and that the instructor can have expectations uh, that kind of mirrored an adult so to speak. So I feel like, you know, starting at 12, you can kind of treat the kids as adults and kind of uh, start guiding them towards that direction. But I would say, you know, if you're talking about as young as four and six year olds, uh, I don't even think the focus should really be on jujitsu. It should be on, you know, coordination and, and developing motor skills and things like that. Now, the tricky part is like that middle gap, right? Like seven years old to 11 years old. I feel like, you know, kids mature at different rates. You have that nine-year-old that looks 15 and you have that 11-year-old that looks six years old. And that's a really hard age group because everyone develops at different ages. And, you know, some kids take jujitsu seriously and don't want to get held back by the kids that don't. Some kids are just there because their parents make them. And they want to goof off and and, and and just have fun. So I think that, uh, you know, the jiu-jitsu program has to cater to that. You know, I think your standalone classes throughout the week should be geared towards, you know, more jiu-jitsu fundamentals, non-competitive skill sets, you know, uh, character building, you know, reiterating to these kids the importance of camaraderie and, 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 and not, uh, you know, uh, you know, anti-bullying, things like that, right? But – a kids program should also offer a competition class to the side. I absolutely believe that because there are going to be kids who want to compete. There are going to be kids like myself at 13 years old. I was already competing in the adults divisions. You know, there are going to be kids that are developing fast at even 10 years old who could take on those responsibilities. So I think as long as there's a balance, then you'll be fine. The problem is when the schools don't offer a competition class and the uh, the age disparity is maybe wider than it should be, then you can come across uh, quite a lot of problems, in my opinion. Yeah, that that makes sense. That's a, that's a good answer too. <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> and then I, I've experienced teaching kids also. Yeah. So, uh, and that's just another like uh, that's just a whole other signs to like coaching. Like being able to coach adults is entirely, it's not even on in the same universe as teaching kids. You know, um, I see these programs where there's only like two instructors on the mat for like 40 kids. And I think that's insane. 
You know, I truly believe at that age, you should be getting almost like personalized attention, like every two minutes, let's say, you know, so I, I do think people have different philosophies on that. But uh, I think that's also something that uh, is uh, instructors should be held accountable for, you know, instructors shouldn't just show up and teach just like jujitsu athletes shouldn't just show up and train. You know, if you're an instructor, you should be, you know, studying, maybe not jujitsu, but study how to be a better instructor and, and studying like uh, a child psychology and things like that, uh, for sure. Yeah. Do you have any, any tips for the, the person like me who uh, would much rather teach a adult class and be more, I'm more intimidated <laughs> by teaching kids. What do you have for me for a tip wise? Yeah. For teaching kids classes? Yeah. Like I struggle with that. Yeah. So one thing I like to do is I just treat the kids like one of the, one of my friends, you know, like, of course there's gotta be a level of maturity and, and professionalism, but don't go in there and, and, and carry the class on like a 1980s karate, uh, uh, class. You know what I mean? Like, uh, super formal and strict <laughs> and punish yeah. the kids for, for not, uh, watching at all times. You know, I think there should be, uh, an energy where the kids can be relaxed and be themselves. And I think when the kids see that you are professional, but at the same time, you're sympathetic and you're understanding and you're having fun, you know, kids can sense that. That's what a lot of people don't realize is that kids are super sensitive to, uh, energies. You know, they can feel when the instructor is carrying on, uh, carrying in the stress from the outside world into the class. And they can feel when the instructor doesn't want to be there and is getting frustrated with the kids. Maybe it's his or her second kids class of the day and the first one didn't go as planned. So they're super like, you know, uh, on edge for this one. You know, they can sense all that. So, you know, it's not the kid's fault that as adults we we have day-to-day issues. So I think it's our job to go to every class as if it's the first class of the week with a fresh new mentality with we should be almost more vibrant and energetic than the kids themselves and, and just treat them like human beings. And I feel like when the kids feel that and they sense that, then they'll actually enjoy being in the classes. Um, uh, and yeah, I think that's a big part of it. And then curriculum is it's, it's more of a perspective thing. Everyone uh, has their way of teaching jujitsu to kids. But I think first and foremost, you know, it's it starts with charisma and attitude. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's awesome. And I, uh, I'll take that advice. And and uh, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not in a position where I teach kids classes but it, yeah. it's a skill that I think everybody uh, who, at some point in time in jiu-jitsu, you're going to be somewhat of a teacher, somewhat of a coach, like even mm-hmm. to just your own teammates. You're going to – like that's what I like. You mentioned several times about going to the beginner, the fundamental class as a blue belt, purple belt, black belt. I love it when I go to a beginner class and there's a black belt or a brown belt in there, like, and then they're helping yeah. out and they're teaching stuff. It's like Dude, not only are they maybe so awesome. gaining some technique – but they're also gaining the skill of working with somebody who's new at jujitsu. That's a huge skill that we gotta we gotta, we have to learn huge. to keep professionalism in it. Yeah, and 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 they might not even realize it, but also by teaching technique, they're getting better at the technique, right? That's essentially what drilling is. When you drill, uh, we call it drilling with feedback. Me and Danny do this a lot. We'll do a technique and we'll ask the other person for feedback. Right. So what are you doing? You're you're basically reverse engineering the process of learning. So when you're teaching someone how to do a move, you're also kind of reinforcing that neural pathway in your head. And you get actually you actually get better at doing that move just by teaching someone. So there's you know, I I can't express it enough how important it is for like higher ranks to help lower ranks, uh, you know, for multiple benefits just like you said you know it, it just teaches you how to deal with people and how to help people and at the same time it, it actually is making your jujitsu better so there's no reason not to you know yeah so what is it about you and 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 danny that has gone so well is it because you're both like able to give each other a, a tough time you know like put me in a position and then you're always able to give him a hard time in that position if he if you know what i mean or is it because um, I like, I don't know what is it about you two that, that are such great yeah. training partners. You, you, you want to know what, what, what it really is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, because, it's because I think we look at each other like you're the only person in this world that's crazy enough to actually stay in a padded room and train all day. And I think we have that notion within ourselves. We know ourselves to be that crazy, but to finally meet someone else that's just as crazy as you that shares that same passion, I think is something that is super special. Like even if 
you know, our roles weren't that competitive. Even if Danny smashed me every day and I had nothing to offer him, you know, in terms of uh, hard training, I feel like just the bond of wanting to learn and, and perform jujitsu the same way is something that you don't really find too much. So honestly, just knowing that there's someone as crazy as I am who's willing to sacrifice everything for jujitsu and to go about it the same exact way is super rare. So it's almost like a no brainer, right? Like why wouldn't we just like, uh, uh, assemble like the Avengers and just like train all day. But no, of course, at the end of the day, we're also compatible training partners. Um, we're like at the literally the same level, right? Like there's days where I beat him and there's days where he beats me. So like, when people talk about me and my training, it's super hard to separate that, that from Danny because, you know, whereas Danny's maybe been full time, like ever since he started jujitsu, I've only been full time since, you know, I graduated college, you know, around this time, maybe last year, right? Like a year and a year and a half ago. Uh, so all I know about full time jujitsu is being pushed by that guy. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And, how, long, how long have and, you guys known each other? uh maybe a little bit longer than that you know like maybe two years so ever since he joined marcellos basically is like when we started getting to know each other and then we started uh you know training and drilling but nothing too crazy uh it really started uh picking up when i knew i would graduate and when my lab director where i was interning told me that i should pursue jujitsu which was like months before i graduated that's when i really started to you know reach out to people (laughs) Hey, uh, to train more and things like hey, that. Hey, Nick, Nick did, did, yeah. did, did you take that as an insult at all to your science ability? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I was like, why are you telling <laughs> me not to make money? Like, am I really not that good? Like, <laughs> no, I think he, I think he was really, it's all your passion. Me. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, he, he's a really good guy. Um, you know, it's funny cause he's not even like, a uh, someone who influences my jujitsu, but he influenced my jujitsu. If that makes sense, like it's 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 crazy how that worked out, but no, I mean I think he wasn't super in love with his choices that he made in his life, and if he can go back, he would have redone it. So his his whole philosophy was help this kid while I can and and steer him in the right direction if I can, you know. Yeah. But yeah, and then at that point, the only crazy person that was willing to lock themselves and and that's what I'm saying. We were quarantined before this pandemic. We were in Sweden training in a five or 10 by 10 room, you know, <laughs> like on a rug, like there wasn't even mats in the apartment, you know, and we, and we would go to the gym in Sweden, like early in the morning, just train all day. So like me and Danny been doing this as, as at the inception of our friendship, you know, and our friendship was is bonded by us wanting to pursue this goal. And I truly believe that together we're going to pursue our goals and become world champions because no one is doing what we're doing. And that's become more obvious when the pandemic hit because when we ask around and see what people are doing, people are literally just on their couches and resting till this blows over. And we've never been working harder than before, wow. you know. So, yeah, that's that's taking opportunity where many people are seeing a, a difficulty. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, we're running a little bit short of time. I'll just ask you a quick, simple question. Yeah, sure. But uh, the Baron Bullet doesn't work, does it? <laughs> ah man this is look you know you were talking about half guard you know how like someone <laughs> was forcing a half guard you know i don't like half guard i despise half guard i wish i would i never had to teach half guard in any class but i would because i truly believe that any move in jujitsu can be effective if applied properly uh i think blanket statements like that are ridiculous um you know, we see the Barambolo work at the highest level. I do the Barambolo uh, uh, effectively on people during training and in competition. So, yeah, I think that's ridiculous. I think any move works. I think there's an example of even like people submitting people from side control with chokes. Like in theory, that shouldn't work, but it happens. You know, so I don't believe in absolutes. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have to say, uh, yeah, no to that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was. Uh... I asked Danny, it would be something I could ask him that would give him a hard time. And he said, okay. tell him the Baron Bullet doesn't work. Uh, yeah, that's like, yeah, you want to get Nick mad? Just say Baron Bullets don't work. <laughs> <laughs> man, I, I've had a blast uh, talking with you. Um, oh, tell man. me, about, you, yeah, you guys got a podcast going on there? Yeah, so uh, we started uh, Bullet Bros Podcast. 
which is basically just me and Danny's way of giving back to the jiu-jitsu community by providing everyone with content. You know, we're putting techniques out there. We're getting uh, high-level athletes and coaches on the podcast and discussing their training methods and how they go about uh, teaching and whatnot. So really pushing and bringing the jiu-jitsu community to a level that we believe it should be at, you know, and, and this is only the beginning. We're doing podcasts, giving travel advice, uh, you know, training advice. So we're doing the best we can. So maybe you don't listen to us, Nick and Danny, but maybe you'll listen to these people. You know what I mean? Like the idea is to provide people so much content that they can kind of pick and choose what they want. Kind of like what you're doing, you know, you're getting so many different perspectives on your podcast and that's because you understand that there's not one way of doing things, right? Like if there was one way of doing things, you would just interview whoever you thought was the best jiu-jitsu guy and that would be it. That Your podcast would have one episode, right? So <laughs> I guess the idea is to, to offer so many different perspectives to people so they can kind of figure out for themselves. And that's really how this one uh, episode started, right? Talking about how you know, uh, there's so many ways to go about jujitsu. Some people are athletic, some people are not. And you, you kind of have to hear all this to kind of figure it out on your own. So that's the idea. That's awesome. And w- where's a good place on social media to follow you and to find the podcast? Yeah. So my tag is that Nick Salas, T H A T Nick Salas. And you can follow the Bullet Bros at, at Bullet Bros Podcast. Uh, we're, we're posting multiple videos and pictures a day like you know i can assure you you're going to learn something uh so go do that and also follow danny you know danny is someone else that's super passionate about it he's at danny freestyle with the one instead of an l in the freestyle so that's another person who uh generates content for bola bros yep i'll put links to the all that stuff in the show notes and uh if you missed danny's interview it's it was last week so uh swing by and check that out yeah and That's I, awesome. Nick, yeah. I, I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Wish you the best of luck with your training, uh, your guys' podcast. That's awesome. And uh, thank you. And anything and I, you have I, going on. You. And if you have any, you know, if you want to get together and train and you, you have any questions, just let me know and, and we'll, we'll make that happen. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Well, bro. All right, guys. Let's do it. Let's train. You heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't <wait for> time. <laughs> Man, I, I want to thank Nick uh, for hopping on here and, and sharing some of his thoughts about Jiu Jitsu. Uh, check him and his uh, close training partner, Daniel, uh, out on the Bolo Bros podcast. Uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Or you can just Google it, and it, I'm sure it'll pop right up either way uh, if you want to get more information from Nick. Yeah, and if you're interested in Hobby Dobby, make sure and check out AJP. They've got. Uh, rankings for the fighters it's a nice nice site i like what they're doing there yeah how's he how's he ranking now for the number one brown belt ranking in the uh north america that's pretty good <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep i still but, just think how he's, awesome. so he's, he's number one in america number one in north america but um 18 overall in the world so that means there's a lot of other really good brown belts out there oh yeah yeah, that's a deep. That's a deep uh, field, man. I just keep going on about uh, you know him and his roommate. Like, how awesome is that? You like, you imagine uh, if you move in next door to them and and you like jujitsu and you know it's like, I don't know. It's almost like the jujitsu neighborhood. I just think that's so cool to, you know, have a, a jujitsu roommate that you're training with during this COVID situation and you guys are just getting better and, and not even the COVID situation. They're, they could be training all the time. Um, I just think it'd be cool. It seems like if you live next door to them, you'd see them out in their backyard with mats and uh, just having a blast and getting better every day. Um, but uh, that would be cool if you just saw houses with mats in the backyard where, you know, kids pick up the football and just play football in the neighborhood or play basketball in the neighborhood. It, it'd be neat if you just saw kids in the neighborhood, just, uh, doing jujitsu all the time. You know what, Gary, all roommates are grappling roommates. If you want them to be, (laughs) (laughs) whether whether they want it or not, (laughs) they're going to have to learn. I'll bet you you bring the heat. I bet you a lot of that's been happening over the last couple of weeks. <laughs> I was going to say, if you bring the heat, they're going to have to learn. So uh, you just go that way. Yeah. I, so for this whole – we don't want to derail into a COVID conversation, but like some people aren't going to come back. They're going to find other things that occupy their time. And it's, it's unfortunate 
for you know the relationships that we that we're going to lose from this is is there going to be out you know joe skateboards is a hobby i've been running but when it comes down to doing jitsu i'm going to stop running as much and i'm going to get back on the mat it's like that's just that's what we want to be same thing with joe maybe he'll skateboard a little less but you know that's something he could do during this this time and but some people will say you know what this skateboarding thing is more enjoyable than jitsu that's fine uh, you know, do what would keeps you healthy and fit and, and, and have a good time. But on the other aspect, maybe a few people will be exposed to it from either a spouse or a roommate. Hey, let me try this arm bar out on you. Uh, and, and then, you know, you, you do it in a way where they actually enjoy it and they get to try it on you. Or maybe they learn something as well. And now they're wanting to go uh, to they're like they're chomping at the bit to go to an actual school and train when they open back up. I think that that will get a few people that way. I don't know what the potential is for that, but you know, another thing I saw Byron is, um, and I think it was Tom to blast. It might've been somebody else, but you know, he was talking about some of the, his zoom classes and, you know, let's say, uh, you train at Tom to blast, but he was getting not only you, your wife would start training, your kids would start training. These are on the zoom classes. they have never done jujitsu before. So, you know, one positive I see there is, you know, some more, people have been exposed to it and maybe, uh, and you know, everybody's starting to, uh, to, uh, come out of this COVID now. So, you know, maybe when the classes, real classes open up or I call them real classes, uh, in person classes open up that, um, uh, uh, more people will come because of being exposed through through zoom. So, uh, that could be a positive there also. I wonder how many coaches are getting messages right now. Like, uh, Hey, hey this is uh, bill Susan's wife. She's one of your students. Uh, how do you how do you defend an Ezekiel joke? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she keeps coming out of the bathroom in her bathroom and joking me. <laughs> Interesting situations. <laughs> Guys, let's uh, roll on into the uh, article here. We have another article uh, about off season training, and uh, I think that's uh, that's the way we need to look at this. Is is we're in in our off season. We haven't had that before. And so with a lot of sports, you take that as a serious time and you work on things. And this article is saying, what do you need to do? Do you need to build a base? This article is on uh, fightcampconditioning.com. And it's really – it's geared towards wrestlers, but it's it's fine for any grappling. Do you need to build uh, that base You know, or do you need to, to work on your knowledge in the weight room? Um, I would say do you need to um, – you know, b- build your knowledge about jujitsu instead of just going and rolling all the time. Or maybe you're building that that knowledge base and you're learning jujitsu more than just doing it right now. Maybe you need to work on physical stuff. You know, that could be it recommends you know strength uh, training three times a week. If that's something that you haven't been doing, now would be a great time to pick that up. Maybe conditioning, maybe flexibility, mobility, uh, speed, balance. I don't you, you know pick a couple elements that need some work. And this is off season. Hit those, and uh, and when you come back to on season, I I really feel like right now I'm in better shape than I was during the quote season of jujitsu before this thing started. I I could I I feel like I'm in great shape right now. I disagree with that, Byron. You're not in great shape right now, Gary. <laughs> I would agree with that. <laughs> no, um, yeah, I, I agree with you about the uh, the off season, and uh, I guess you're right. This is kind of an off season. Jiu-Jitsu is really never kind of off season. It's a year round sport, but uh, this would be a off season time. It's a good time to, uh, like you said, build your strength, build your explosiveness. Um, you know, as me and you have been working on, you know, work on our flexibility and, uh, it's just going to help you get better when it is in season. Joe, do you, you, you sometimes will talk about this, uh, skateboard thing that you do and me never ever <laughs> having any success on a skateboard, literally standing and falling in on a couple times. So that's not for me as a kid. Uh, do you think that skateboarding makes it harder for you to be uh, sometimes swept, maybe or maybe taken down if somebody picks up one of your legs and you're you're fighting to to maintain your balance, or somebody kind of um, off balances you a little bit? Does it help you at all um, with that? With the, just keeping in balance. <sighs> I never really thought about that before. Um, Is that a bit of a stretch? But, but, 
Maybe, hey, I maybe this, maybe this, Joe. Maybe it helps you fall more safely. <laughs> well, now, now that I have thought about, <laughs> I don't, I don't know any skateboarders without a wrestling background or something that would talk about break falling. But you know how you do the the very beginner break fall where you sort of put your arm underneath and, and roll over your shoulder and, and it's pretty – when you watch skateboarders fall like they try and uh, ollie down 10 stairs or something, that's exactly how they fall. And uh, it, it's better to just take the fall and roll with it than to try and run out of it usually. And so I, I do think it helps you with your fall. And it can't hurt with your balance, that's for sure. Yeah. You know, Joe, when Byron just brought that up about your skateboarding, you know, I was just thinking about your life as a mariner, too. I, it's, you know, I, I probably more relevant. With, uh, not getting <laughs> yeah. Swept. The, yeah. The boat's always trying to put you on your ass. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think that helps you, too, with skateboarding, too. Um, I don't know. I just think so much about how that boat moves. Uh, you know, you've been around that your whole life. And uh your balance has to be better than most. And uh, I think that would help you a little bit more in skateboarding. Like Byron said, me and him have tried it. And, you know, we haven't put in the time like you have. But, I mean, skateboarding is tough. It, it, it looks easy if you watch it. I mean, if you're not doing ollies or whatever, if you're just skateboarding on the street, it looks easy. It is not uh, not easy at all. It's uh, it's uh, Those are very skilled athletes. Um, but, um yeah, that was just one thing that just popped into my mind when Byron was talking about if skateboarding helped you. I, I, I really think that the, the being a mariner and being on boats all your life would, would help you big time, too. At the end of this article, it says hard work is what you bring to it, but science is what makes it effective. I like that quote. That's a, that's a good way to think about jujitsu as well as wrestling. Uh, bring your hard work, but the science behind it is what makes it effective. I've never heard that for jujitsu. Have you guys? That's a that's a good word. I guess we could have two quotes of the day. Um, yeah, I've I've never heard that either. But it also kind of makes me think about uh, our quote of the week too. You know, uh, the science part. Are you? Do you just frame it on your wall, or do you uh, do you really do it? Yeah, do you just read this article and say that's interesting? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or do you start training in the off, in treating this as an off season and and really get in great shape? Yeah. So so the uh, article is definitely written specifically for wrestlers and the type of season and the type of sport and um, so if if you're not necessarily a highly competitive jujitsu athlete if you don't play that kind of game. Um, if you're not a big competitor, uh, y- you might read the article and think it has limited application to you, but it's still a great article. And I would further suggest that, uh, we're talking about training smart. We're talking about science. So if you're not looking for strength and conditioning, like a wrestler during this time off, if you're looking for flexibility, find some articles by some smart people that have done the research and, and do it smart. I mean, you can make a lot of more gains in your flexibility if you're following some type of program or 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 uh, the advice of people that have researched the science than if you just make up your own, I'm going to try this stretch for 50 seconds and I'm going to bounce up and down for 10 seconds or whatever. Make sense, guys? I like it, Joe. Yeah, that's that's – I've been bouncing between those two things where I'll stretch on my own and I don't really – I just, you know, do my best or – uh, throw a YouTube video up on it and have somebody guide me through a, a series of stretches. Uh, yeah, that's that's way better. Um, it's just I need to uh, need to get in the habit of doing that and have those guided but, stretches. But even when you're doing it yourself, you've already done some research and collected some information about you know the difference between static stretches and dynamic stretches and the type of stretches that are more beneficial to what you're doing. So even when you're doing it on your own, you you've already done some research and you're doing it smart, correct? I, I don't do a lot of things smart, correct? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're you're right. Well, you're right. Yeah, you know, Byron, you have done research on it. You you have you know, watch some of the videos you have been doing stretching on your own, but that stretching on your own is probably a little bit off of stuff you've read, stuff that you've learned through gym class when you were young and, and through the videos you're watching now and, and you are doing it consistently, which is, uh, you know, paying dividends for you. 
And I do like dividends. I like gym class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all do. Guys, yeah. uh, I just want to give a quick shout out to our newest Patreon supporter, Brian Hendricks. Thank you, my friend, for uh, supporting Thank you, us on, Brian. on Patreon. Just send him out the five inch BJJ Brick Gee Patch and a sticker. And Brian, if you want to join our private Facebook group, uh, send me a message on Facebook. Uh, you can find me. And just find BJJ Brick on Facebook and then let us know. That's probably easy, <laughs> easiest way. Um, but there's a few Brian Hendrixes out there and for me to find you. It's, it's a little bit uh, trickier. So if you want that uh, to join the private group and you're in Patreon uh, and supporting us, we'll be happy to have you. Yeah, Byron, it'd probably be better for him to find BJJ Brick. Like you said, there's a lot of Brian Hendricks out there, and you start hitting every one of them up, pretty soon you're going to be banned from Facebook with all the complaints they're going to get about you. I Yeah, I already get plenty. <laughs> Well, anyway, uh, we're planning on next week having a topic episode. The uh, topic is a little bit up in the air. Uh, a topical episode? Yeah. A topic episode. Topical. Tropical? Trop- Ooh, okay. I know where we're going to go with this one. Um, well, Joe's already in uh, uh, south of New Orleans, so that's probably tropical. We're getting there. It's at least humid. <laughs> so... <laughs> Any, anyway, my friends, keep training and uh, stay sweaty, my friends. And don't forget to shower. Train hard, train smart, and get better, guys. We'll see you on the mats one of these days. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You can visit our website at bjjbrick.com for more good times swing by and like our facebook page our email is bjjbrick at gmail.com